And now, only on KGRA Radio, this is the Starborn Connection. Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to another Starborn Connection. Uh, it's going to be a pretty upside-down show, I guess, because we only have Tom uh, read until 11 o'clock, so we're going to get right into Tom, and then uh, we will do the first hour and the second hour. You, you got that? That's, that's pretty confusing. But uh, no, we'll, do, we'll take care of everything. Um, let me just because let me see okay got it let let me read uh tom's bio for anybody that's tuning in fresh this week um as you oh wait a minute hello julia hi how are you <laughs> all right all right and we're very uh, confused <laughs> okay bill hey give michael him news give him the news about our thing Oh, yes. Um, for those that are watching my YouTube and for everybody that's listening on KGRARadio.com, we're going to have a special um, presentation, a live show here with Michael, Julia, and Mark D'Antonio and myself sometime the end of November and possibly early December. So everybody stay tuned for that. So it should be a special oh, show. God, I can't wait. That's going to be awesome. All right. Let's go along with here, uh, Tom Reed. Okay, listen, Tom Reed grew up in the home of William Roosevelt, the grandson of President Roosevelt, in Cherry Hills, Colorado. His grandmother was employed by the Roosevelts with the residents uh, on the property. Tom's late father, Dr. Howard Reed, was an attorney in, in public office. As of October 2015, the Reed UFO case of September 1st, 1969 is officially the first UFO case to be inducted into the United States as a historically significant and true event. This is uh, per office of the governor and that of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Historical Society. Now, in 2015... A 5,000-pound monument was unveiled on its 46th anniversary in honor of this modern-day history. Um, the Tom Reed UFO Monument Park was built this past summer and actually sits at the precise location of that September 1st, 1969 encounter in Sheffield, Massachusetts. The park re represents progress and history and will forever remain the location of the first historically true UFO encounter in the United States. It's open 24 hours a day and free to the public. This UFO encounter has been the subject of several documentaries as well as the uh, S1E1 launch of Discovery Channel's oh, Season 1, Episode 1, boy, how dumb, launch of Discovery Channel's <laughs> Alien Mysteries. Models and director of Paraween, a celebrity hosted paranormal conference held in Salem during Salem Haunted Happenings and is an ABA top 100 event. Without any further ado, Mr. Tom Reed. Tom, welcome again. Hey, hey Mike, thanks for having me. Ah, no problem at all. We, uh, you're, you're, you're one of the, um, what do you call it? The Honor, honorable or, or high-ranking members of the KGRA family here. <laughs> Extended family, yeah. that's what I wanted to hear. Yes, exactly. Well, listen, so, I don't want to yeah. waste any more time. I want you to get into, uh, you wanted to talk about Paraween, you wanted to talk about the park tonight. Um, take it away. Yeah, okay. Uh, if it's all right with you, um, with that intro, I thought maybe I'd just, you know, brush up a little bit and tell people what, how that all, how that intro works. Uh, come to oh, man. my grandmother yeah. and everything. All right, my grandmother actually uh, used to live in Colorado, and she was actually the governess for Franklin Della Roosevelt's grandchildren. And my mother was out in California, uh, you know, married uh, my first my, my birth father, 
and uh, it, it didn't work out, so she was getting divorced. And my grandmother and the Roosevelt said, hey, come stay with us. That's how I ended up staying at the Roosevelt's. Mm. It was just my grandmother was their governess. And, um, but it also um, drove my mother at the time to really support my father's uh, aspirations to, to do something in public office. So that was kind of how the whole – you know, that whole political thing came into play. And of course, he did run, and, and he was uh, he didn't make it very far, but I mean, he was still uh, you know ran a small town, and 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 it's that connection um, with his the people that he used to know and our family used to run with, I guess, that uh, is part of the reason that they took this so much more seriously and looked into it, and and um, and I don't you know it's not the to to imply that it's any more significant or important than anyone else's case. It just happens to be one that had enough luck around it and enough people around it that um you know they they looked at it maybe a little more seriously than than some cases and i and that's kind of how this whole thing happened but i but at the same time i i don't um you know i don't uh you know uh feel any differently about it than than my friends that that have cases or or involved in something i mean I, i just think that it that because mainstream is behind it now it's it's a good uh segue for other people to start following suit on how this got elected and i'd like to mm. maybe help help other people to realize how you can get this done that'd be great uh, yeah it's the the bottom the this how our case got inducted is not because it was directly um involved with a ufo case it wasn't just that it had to do with a sighting or an abduction or a a per, you know personal upfront encount it had to do with how it affected the community and we talked about this a lot last week but for those who didn't tune in last week and so if you could show that an event took whatever it is whether it's ufo related or, an, or it doesn't have any any event affected the community long enough and profound enough then that event becomes historically significant to that township. Just like Travis. Travis could probably get his inducted. I mean, it, 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 he upset an entire – this event that he was involved with Oh yeah. created yeah. a stir for the entire town. They went through the fields with dogs and thinking he was – I mean, that affected Snowflake. So therefore, if – you know, we've talked – I've talked to Travis a little bit about it. If, if he were to pursue that, he probably could get his inducted as well. And I know that um, – that uh, I think it's a McMinnville, you know. There's a case out there, the McMinnville yeah, case. Yeah, right, right. That that's that's in the historical society, but it, it hasn't been inducted into into state as a as a true event. But it, you know, th- there's cases that are that are teetering right now, and even the Phoenix Lights. I mean, the Phoenix Lights. Oh, right, are, Dr. Kaite. Yep, that'll probably get inducted one day. So we just happened to be first, and we had a lot of uh, political ties that that. Uh, or those in, in, in still in office, or who uh, uh, remember and respected my my late father, who uh, wanted to uh, to look into this with with, with uh, you know a little more carefully than yeah. than others cases may have gotten um, you know looked at. Anyway, so that's how that happened. And so back in uh, 2015, when this happened, the it was really only inducted into the local historical society, the Great Barrington Historical Society, and that was through Debbie Oberman. Well, Debbie Oberman actually got it into the historical society, not as a, a, a display. It still doesn't have a display at the historical society because this, the building in Great Barrington is actually under construction right now. But it's um, it, it was inducted as a historically true event to the historical society, and the historical society was actually planning on holding events themselves. And they were actually trying to do something on its anniversary, which is in in, in uh, 2019. Well, because of some press and things, and you know the you know there was a little bit of a ruckus. You know how it is. No, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, things kind of slowed down. The the momentum kind of slowed down a little bit, and and um, and so they just let it resonate for a little bit. And there was some turbulence there. Some people were into it. Some people were not. But um, and then. Um, and then uh, after about a year that it was sitting there, they actually had submitted it to the uh, the Historical Society in Boston. A lot of people don't realize that either. It didn't just get inducted into Great Barrington. It actually went to the Historical Society in Boston. Mm. And that's where the Historical Society, the Massachusetts Commonwealth Historical Society, um, did not um, kick it back. They basically said, look, we, have, we don't have anyone that specializes in this, 
And there was actually an article that came out in the paper. It was in uh, the Berkshire Eagle that said that this case actually sits next to Paul Revere and the Boston Tea Party and, wow. and, and oh, the antiquity man. and the antiquity of, of Massachusetts. Yeah, so it actually got inducted into state that way. And then, of course, the governor put his stamp on it. And then after they got the the two citations from the governor and the two one letter and the two letters from the Historical Society, then they were stamped and sealed. By a circuit court judge in the third thirtieth dist district court, and notarized, and so they are official documents. I mean, this there is no no turning back. This case is actually inducted as true history, and that's never been done before. It doesn't mean it's any better than anything else, or but it just happens to have broken down a barrier that, and I'm proud of that. Absolutely. And so, and so with that is why I hold Paraween now because. It's Salem is only a couple hours outside of Sheffield, and uh, depending on how you drive, but it's about two hours. And and because the historical society now um, has decided they're not going to uh, do anything uh, as far as events go, I guess they don't really know how to hold events. And when they went to try it originally back in 2015, uh, they don't live. The Sheffield's not near a major major highway. There's no you know. Oh, no, okay. Yeah, it's out in the middle of nowhere. It's farm community. So when they first started to put it together and saw the cost behind it, they decided, well, you know, there's no point in doing it. And uh, so then I was looking um, into going to Salem to visit some friends. And uh, Lynn, you know, Lynn, Lynn was out there too in Beverly. Mm -hmm. And we talked a couple uh, years ago, I guess, or about a year and a half ago. And and uh, she's like, well, why don't you just do it here? So I got in touch with the mayor, the mayor of Salem. And uh, she was a. Uh, I didn't really know my father, but looked into it, and because our case has a true historical connection to the state of Massachusetts, or Commonwealth, I should say, um, they kind of welcomed us as to be part of Haunted Happenings, and that's kind of where this set, sits right now is and how I got involved with Paraween. Now, Par being that Salem is a very young crowd, um, a lot of young people, colleges, you know, you've got uh, – I mean, I think it's two hundred and fifty thousand people go to Par you know, go to oh, yeah. sale where yeah. Paraguay will be. And so I wanted to make it fun, you know, not to um make light of the topic, but when you've got two hundred and fifty thousand people drinking and the average age is twenty five, you have to make it entertaining oh, God, yeah. You know, yeah. to them, right? So you have to make it kind of fun. So I thought, well, you know, we'll um We'll make it fun on the outside, and then the rooms where the talks are will be serious. You know, those topics will be serious, but at the same time, let's enjoy ourselves too. And I think that's how you reach young people. I, I, uh, I, I wouldn't want to uh, be going to college and then on my break and, and then go to a Halloween event and then be lectured. You know what I mean? I just don't oh, think right. that's, <laughs> that's what they want. So I wanted to make it fun. So that's kind of where we are with Paraween. And this year we've got Lionsgate. We've got uh, – um, they're coming to. Uh, they're going to do some show some clips of uh, the new Saw film, Jigsaw. Oh wow! Uh, then I've got uh, Paramount Pictures is going to be there. Now I say Paramount Pictures, I mean reps for Paramount Pictures. Oh right, right. And uh, but it is Paramount, and uh, they're local Boston reps for Paramount, and they work for the promotions department for Paramount. So they're going to be showing um, clips and. And, and not the whole film, but like a teaser for um, Suburbicon with Matt Damon. Oh, who was, boy. Who was That's going to be good. <laughs> yeah, it was produced by George Clooney. And then we're going to be screening the uh, Blair Witch uh, legacy film. And, uh, you know, Travis will be there and Mike Barr will be there and Dolan's going to Skype in. And we've, we've got a lot of Skype guests, too. And I thought it, maybe I'd mention this, too. The way we've done it this year, we've got like three screens in the banquet room. You've got the one speaker. Let's hypothetically say it's Mike. Um, so Mike's going to talk maybe about um, his book, uh, about the moon, Mars, ancient aliens, whatever he wants. And while he's talking and showing his PowerPoint, you're going to have two additional screens, one on each side, and for Skype guests to come in. So maybe Nick Redfern will come in. So, mm -hmm. so you're basically going to have a panel and only one live person, but the other two will be a panel. So you'll have Mike, you'll have the PowerPoint. You'll have the clips he's running. Then you might have Nick Redfern Skyped in on one side and whoever – maybe uh, David you know, Ch you know, Childress on the other. So it depends right, on right. who wants to do it, but that's how it's – that's how how it works. And, and in between, we're going to be playing uh, – you know, they got Kiss playing. They're going to have DVDs of concerts and stuff because we have a 45-minute break in between. Then we've got Eye Candy from the Paranormal After Party who's going to be doing a show there. And then you know, so we've got the bar opens up. Everyone can have drinks and cocktails and then wow. – 
you know, 15 minutes before the next speaker, or, you know, whoever it is, <laughs> they do the same thing. So basically they put on a two-hour two hour show with drinks in between, and then the vendor area is open to the public. I mean, you don't even need a ticket to get to the vendor area. Wow. And so, you know, I think it's going to be a good time. I mean, it's uh, – I want it to be fun, but I want I don't want the message to be lost because it's a serious subject, but – how do you reach younger people? How do you get exactly? People, how do you get people to maybe listen to you? How, if you were going to, you know, it, today, you know, the way it was worded to me, and I was, this is back in the day, I was talking to Lynn about it. You know, the average uh, UFO conference is an older crowd, and and the young people, I don't think, realize that some of these pinnacle people, they're not, they're not going to be around. You know, I I never met Jesse Marcel Senior. I met his son. <sighs> Mm -hmm. past, I would have loved to have met him. I've never met, you know, Betty or Barney. I would have loved to have met them. So those that are 25 or, or 28 or whatever, they're just getting out of school now. Um, you know, it would be a shame for them to have been had an opportunity to meet Stanton or Kathleen or Travis or whatever. And, and then, you know, before that opportunity is gone. And so this is my way of introducing or trying to introduce a younger crowd to those people that that really drove this topic, those people who really made a difference, that etched this subject into into history in, in one way or another, and became um, so significant because you know we're, we don't live forever. Yeah, and, right. And uh, so uh, yeah. if it's going to take a couple of rum and cokes and, <laughs> and a couple screens and you know and and make it a little lighter for you know so people can you know have some fun at the same time. Hey, it's I think at the end of the day. Um, they're going to have a good time, and, and they're going to realize that they learned something. Yeah, I think so too. And not only that, you know, you're absolutely right about the younger crowd because you know all the conferences I go to, uh, you know, people are getting older, older oh, and are. older. I'm are getting right? older. Oh, and they're, <laughs> I, I think you have the best idea I've ever heard to draw the Thank younger you. crowd in. I Thank really you. do, and I think uh, Paroween is going to be something. Uh, that will probably maybe even move into multi-states because uh, this is the way we draw people in. We give them a good time and we talk to them about serious subjects and show them uh, movies, right. have them meet people. It's great. It's fantastic. Yeah. I think so. And this way, you know, you can show a clip from a show and say a lot of people have seen it and say, OK, well, that's not what really happened. This is what happened, yeah. and so the, and so they they get the entertainment aspect from the TV show, but then they get the facts from you, right? And, and right. so they get that rush of the TV show. I saw that, you know, and then they realize they're actually speaking to you or the person, whoever that show or, or is about. That and, and they realize, wow, I heard it firsthand, and that's not something they're going to forget. And at the same time, I did have a unique opportunity because when I had Miami Models, I was doing a lot of, I was booking a lot of girls and runway shows, and I had some connections. So that also helped me get this off the ground. But you know, at, at the end of the day, um, it, it's it's got to work. It's got to be. Uh, I, I think it's a. Like you said, I, it, it has a lot of possibilities, and let, next year we're going to be in St. Augustine, Florida, and I think the year after that we're going to be in Savannah, Georgia, and then in um, and, and 2019 we'll be back in Sheffield for the 50th anniversary of our event being inducted. Um, so uh, maybe next year we'll be in Savannah and, and St. Augustine at the same time. Savannah and St. Augustine are only two hours away from each other. So. Yeah, right. They're close. Yeah, they're close. So you know, if you if I did something uh, one week in Savannah, I could I could just keep everybody over and take them into St. Augustine, rent a boat. We could all go fishing, do you know whatever, and uh, keep you know keep everybody and have a. Basically, I've got friends who live there. There are houses there. People can st freaking Salem, three hundred dollars a night for oh. a hotel. Oh sure, easy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you know how many nights I needed? Oh, I'm 12. sure. <laughs> Twelve. Twelve. Ah, man. Yeah, this this a, you know, Paraween ran me ran me over <laughs> eight eight thousand three hundred dollars to put on Paraween. Eight thousand three hundred dollars I got invested in Paraween. Wow, jeez. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a big that's a big event. I mean, for me it is. 
Yeah. Oh, no. One, it is. And, it's a, and it's a one day event, but we have all day tickets. You can get in there, come and go as you want to. Um, you know, you, it's an open door, or you can get tickets just for Travis or Mike or myself. Or And then anyone who has a ticket gets to see the screening for free, plus the vendors for free. So, you know, we're not raking people over the coals either. I mean, you can get tickets for 25 bucks. So it's not like we're charging 100 or 200. We're not here to make money. Just if we can cut even, it would be amazing. But it's more, it's more the idea. It's more of the philosophy. I want people to understand that, hey, this is a little bit different. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, yeah. And I got the idea. I, I know I'm rambling. I got the idea from when I used to do fashion runway shows. If you if you had a competitor like Nike or Versace or or Polo or or whatever, you know, and you didn't care about Nike or you didn't care about Reebok or whatever, who else was there? You only wanted to see that one particular line. You mm-hmm. didn't want to sit all day on a fold out chair, you know, until that line came up. So that's where I thought, well. So we'll do an individual track, and that's kind of what it was with the with the models. You know, it was a track. If I wanted to see what, you know, what Gucci had, I'll go see Gucci. But I'm not going to sit and see what Macy's is running. You know, who could care? I don't care less. Right. So, so that's what this is. So you and you've got so many things to do in Salem. You can, you know, eat over here, do this, go to the park. You know, go go see a tour. You may not want to spend all day in one building. Oh right, right. And that's that's another thing with Salem that's different than most places. There, even St. Augustine doesn't have the nightlife Salem does. You know, right. And I, and I grew up in Salem. I was I was fifteen, sixteen years old. I was hanging out in Salem. I, I mean, I grew up right outside Salem. So Salem's kind of home to me in a lot. Yeah, of and you know it well, and you know uh, you know what to do, where to do it, and uh, yeah, yeah. Have you have you been to Salem? I've been to Salem a couple of times. Yeah. All right. You know the Ferris wheel. They got rides. They got games. They've got mm-hmm. a I mean, I don't think people even realize that they have all that. So it's don't. not just witch trials. You know? right. right. No, I know, right? You've got, I mean, yeah. and, and the hotel that I've got is right next to the, like that theme park they've got there. So you can leave the building for half an hour and go, go to, you know, to go on some rides and have a couple drinks and come back and you, and you, and before the next speaker starts. It's, it's, do, it's, yeah. Do, do they still have the House of the Seven Gables there? I don't know. To be honest with you, that, I don't know. When I was younger, so, we went up there to see that. That was, I think, it was a movie or something, and uh, it was filmed in that house, and and uh, it was kind of like a an attraction, way yeah. back, way back. It's probably yeah. still there because they can't get rid of those. That's no, anything right. that's certified historic has to stay. So I'm ha- sure it's still there. Yeah. yeah, she's right. Absolutely. It's, it's yeah, exactly. And they got Lizzie Borden house there too. Yes. Which is yes. Cool. Yeah. So, and matter of fact, lucky is going to be at the event. She's the one who does the tours about the Lizzie Borden house. So she's going to be stopping by too. So she'll, she'll be there. So it's going to be a lot of fun, man. And, and, um, anybody on your show again, that they want to save, uh, you know, 20% or whatever, there is that coupon that Bill mentioned earlier. And, and hopefully uh, you'll take you know take advantage of it. We also had a his and hers ticket too. So if you uh, buy a ticket for yourself, you basically get hers for half price, basically. So oh, that's, nice. that, that's on the site now too. So um, anyway, so that's that's how Paraween came about and and uh, where my head is right now. And I'm trying to take what happened and make it uh, or turn it into something positive, not just for myself, but for a lot of people. And and hopefully this will filter um, or or uh, bleed over to Sheffield and Great Barrington and and uh, they'll stop thinking that uh, you know they'll stop writing that it's only wackadoodles who you know are into the right, subject right. <laughs> which was front page news at the local paper so yeah it's so it's horrible the way people are but anyway um, so uh, yeah if you have any questions or anything or what would you like to well we've, we've uh, got we've got a pretty big audience tonight too because terrific. we're simulcasting on YouTube okay. uh, and um, I don't know uh, Bill, do you want to try the the phone? Yeah, let's do that. See if okay. Listen, uh, listen to Bill. He's he's going to give you a phone number. If you want to call in with a question for Tom, please do so. Yes, just dial eight four five three nine one three one one one. Again, it's eight four five three nine one three one one one. And I'll let you guys know if we get a call. Okay, sounds, sounds good. good. Okay, sounds good. So the um, you were saying earlier about the park up there that uh, uh-huh. they didn't want to have they they don't want to have any kind of fairs or anything there. 
Well, the, the whole park thing, uh, it, it's kind of funny. In the very beginning when they first put the – and they call it a monument. It's really not a monument. It's a marker. And and I don't know. Do you know – let me ask you this. Do you know how the marker got there, who built the marker, how it ended up there? No, a lot of, no. Okay. See, a lot of people don't know this stuff. The marker was not put there by the town. The marker was actually funded by locals who saw it, and they all pitched in twenty dollars, oh, wow, thirty dollars yeah. out of their pocket. These were people who gave testimony and statements to the historical society. Some did, some didn't, but they basically there's a, a, a three or four other people there because again, this wasn't just didn't just happen to us. It happened to an awful lot of people in that area. I mean, it was a widely witnessed thing, and so a lot of people thought, well, somebody had started, you know. A TV show or two came out about it, and the town was talking about it. So people started to donate to a particular person to build some type of a monument, and that's how the monument came. It's actually funded and built by locals. It was actually built by local people. It was built by farmers. I mean they framed it in at a farm, and they donated money to build it, and that's wow. and that's how the whole thing came to be. So when they put it in place, moved it into place over there, uh, the town really kind of – I guess they don't. I don't think they realized how big it was. You know, I don't. I thought when they when they gave the approval to put a marker there, a little monument there, I think they probably were envisioning something maybe three feet tall, two feet wide. They weren't expecting something the size of a double wide refrigerator. <laughs> so, and I think that they got upset about it because it, it, they thought it, that it detracted from the bridge and everything. That's where all that came up. So they they moved it away from the bridge a little bit, which is fine, but. Where the marker is now is actually basically where we saw the thing too. So it actually was moved to the almost the exact location. The the park itself or that area of park um, that's now sponsored by the Roswell Museum. It's sponsored by Travis Walton. It's sponsored by you know Ben Hansen, um, a millionaire out of uh, a, a uh, New Orleans, and um, and so there's there's solar lights in there. There's a uh, mulch going down they've chopped down trees and now you can basically i mean i've got a before and after picture on the on the website the ufo monument park and you can kind of see how how nice they've made it and there's a lot of yeah. volunteers now and and so the park is run by volunteers i mean it's uh it really is i mean it's uh, the town has allowed uh volunteers to um to to make it into something but they also keep an eye on it because they don't want to go too far you know they don't you know, they they keep a, every now and then I'll go over there and, and it's a thousand miles from my house. But when I'm there, even then you'll see a, an officer walking around once in a while. So they do keep a close eye on it. But then again, the bridge was also lit on fire and burned to the ground. So, oh God! Yeah. <laughs> so, well, now you you had you had said that um, the monument itself had been defaced a couple of times, right? Yeah, twice. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, and, and and again, I think what happens is you still have. Uh, it's there's an ignorance. Let's face it. I mean, there really is an ignorance even today. And and I think um, you know, I think science and and, and even common sense seems to. Uh, we all seem to gather knowledge in, in some respect faster than than most can change. You know what I mean? We we things. Uh, science moves quickly, and, and I think we become stuck and in, in a certain. Uh, you know, like a time warp, and it's uh -huh. hard for people to to move on. You know, it's harder for people to to accept things, and and it is an older, you know, kind of it is a farming community. It's not like it's Colorado, right? So, you know, you, you it is going to take a while for everybody, I think, to kind of um to let it absorb. You know, to to let it. It's going to have to resonate. You know, it resonates with certain people, but it's not. It's going to take a while for it to really. Uh, uh, Means something to everyone else. However, if if you are at the park and you're walking around, every mostly everyone there that hangs out there remembers it. That's a strange thing. When I was there with Sean and I was there with uh, some people m taking care of the park and they were cutting down trees and there were workers there. I was only there for one day. Um, there were a lot of people coming through the park on, on ATVs and everything else, and they were like, "Yeah, I saw it when I was a kid. I was." looking out that window over there or – and they all have a story on how they saw it too. So I think the fact that the community is so behind it, whether a few people in a town hall or or uh, maybe a, you know, a selectman or two is not a big you know, in favor of it, they're 
so outnumbered at this point. I mean, they are just so there are so many more people that are supportive of it than not supportive of it. And I think that is what's going to, um, you know, Travis and I are going to be there on the 22nd. You know, we're leaving Parawine and we're going on Sunday. We're going to do a meet and greet, free meet and greet, shake some hands, do some, oh, that's take cool. some pictures. Yeah. yeah, maybe we'll even walk over to the town hall, the historical society. And, um, you know, let people know, look, you know, we're all very grounded, down to earth people. I mean, don't, and I think that's what they need to see, you know, this idea that, you know, uh, you know, just. Every- Everybody yeah. who's seen a UFO uh, or been abducted, they're kooks. That's not true at all. Yeah, and that's kind of, I think, the uh, the hurdle that this park has ahead of it. And I think that's why the 22nd is, is so important because I think they're going to actually see that. You know, when people come over and, and Travis is shaking hands and I'm shaking hands and, you know, Sean's over there and a few other people and other people that saw it from that day that, that have given testimony to the, the Historical Society, they're going to be there too. And – and I think they're going to say, wow, you know, this – it's just – it is what it is. Yeah. You know, and there's no other way to really word it. It just is what it is. And, and you know, even when I was younger, I I fought it. You know, I, I was thinking to myself, uh, you know, y- you overthink. You know, you're like, holy, you know, and, and you and you catch yourself going, you know, did I just see what I saw? Did I that, – that just happened to me. And – and I think it happens with anything, you know, whether, you know, maybe uh, you hit a dog driving down the road. You're like, oh, oh, yeah, right. You know, those those moments where you're like, did that just happen? You know, and and then you, it happens again and again. And you, you start being reminded that, you know, you can't overthink it. You just have to follow your intuition and and say, OK, and let go sometimes and say it is what it is. And yeah, yeah. And, and until you can accept it and, and uh, do that, you're always going to have that fight in your head and I think I played with that a lot too I toyed with that my head was always going a mile a minute I was you know because I, I was overthinking all the time I was trying to make sense of something that maybe didn't make sense at the time yeah exactly and you, and some things aren't meant to make you know we're not ready to understand everything so open up and accept it and realize that hey we don't know everything and tomorrow is another day and we're going to learn as we go and when you have that idea in your head and you understand that you know we are still learning you know there's so much we don't know just you know open up you know and realize that hey you know we you know maybe we were contacted for a reason um maybe it was a purely accident maybe there's a more going on. Obviously, there's more going on here than we know. Maybe there's dimensions that, you know, who knows really? I mean, there's a lot of things going on, but not every incident and every encounter encompasses the same elements. Right. And so, right. but there is more out there, and you just have to realize that uh, it. You don't have to subscribe to sensationalism to understand that there's much more going on, and I think that's where the People have a trouble uh, trouble doing, or, or or that line, that fine, that line that people don't want to cross. They don't want to get to that point where they say, "You're right, you know, there is much more." And then right. once you once you do that, everything starts to make sense, or yeah. at least it starts to unfold. Well, I think the meet and greets are great because you know somebody will go out and they'll they'll go to see uh, fire in the sky, let's say, and, and they get one one kind of mental picture of of what happened. Uh, and then they come talk to Travis, and you know, over the years, Travis has kind of said, and he, and we were talking about this too. He said, uh, you know, I think maybe I was abducted by mistake. You know, they they right. hit me with that beam, uh, and then they brought me on board to try and fix me because I wasn't supposed to be there. You know, uh, and right. that you know that's a very sensible uh, you know way to look at it. Sure. And and so many people think you know you watch these uh, programs or whatever, and all this other other life out there is always you know mean or angry. I don't I don't remember. I don't feel like I I think if there was any harm to come to us, it would have happened a long time ago. I think I think this planet. If you look at you know how many uh, well depending on who you talk to, but five to seven world you know extinctions. Yes. Um, yeah. And yet we have hundreds of millions of species on this planet today they came from somewhere because after 
not one extent <laughs> they were an entire you know it didn't wipe out the entire planet but enough that there shouldn't be millions of species here today after seven extinctions and, and yet you ask yourself well okay that meant you know there had to be opposite sex of all these animals you know everything you know insects and you know what are, all and all there had to be two of everything and they had to be next to each other to populate that just doesn't happen you know, I look at this planet as one big arc. That's the way I look at it. There, I think there's been a lot of life that had been brought here from other planets, and and, uh, and maybe it's a safe haven. Um, and if that's the case, then they're certainly not here to to give us a hard time. You know, it's, they're not fallen angels and all that crap you hear. It's right. There's a reason we are. This is a safe haven, I think. You know. Um, you know, polar bears are where they need to be. Tigers are where they need to be. Every animal seems to be where it needs to be to thrive and live, and and, and it just it's too perfect. This we the Earth rotates on a strange axis, so we have, you know, every climate you can want. I mean, it's amazingly set up, you know. You you know that, yeah. And, and so if you depending on where you are, I mean, you can have a, you know, life just. Live exactly, you know, the rainforest or the desert or Siberia, um, and and so with that said, I think we also, um, at least personally, I think, and you might disagree with me on this, but I, I think that um, wherever we came from, and I don't think that we are native to here by any means. No, we're um, not. <laughs> right, I, I'm with you. So, but here's a here's a. I feel better in water. I. I oh wow. My back, like ever everyone else, we get back pain. You know, we got problems with our neck muscles. We have varicose vein issues. We have knees that go out on us. Our ankles go out. Our spine seems to shrink as we get. We're not meant for this gravitational pull. No, we're not. Absolutely not. You know, I right, and I get in a in a pool or something. I'm like, oh god, I feel great, right? Because I'm soaking. So wherever we're from, or at least I believe this, and I could be wrong. I've been wrong before, but it's just it's just something inside me that says, you know, wherever we were from. Uh, they didn't have this gravitational pull on our body, and if that's the case, and we were meant to have this eight hours on or eight hours off or twelve hour days or however it is, this, this time frame, then chances are we actually must have come from a smaller planet, because it would have taken, you know, picture the time it would have taken to rotate, right? Yeah. So if it was yeah. A, a less of a gravitational pull, the planet's turning slower, so the time. So, either way, um, yeah, we. I don't think that we were meant to uh, to be here, but it works. So it does, yeah, it, it really does. Hey, and uh, the the alien that communicates with my friends Ilona and Ivana uh, Podraska, uh, he he tells us, and you know, uh, I kind of believe that uh, you know the spiritism that they use is is you know bringing this alien in to talk with Ivana, but. Uh, they're here to watch over us. They're here to kind of like uh, keep an eye on us, and, and they're you know they're ready to educate us and and tell us about you know where they're from and and what they're doing here, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and and yeah, I, I think I I really think that it's a positive thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I believe so. I believe so. So. Um... All right, so no one's called in. So do you, do you want to just uh, you have any questions yourself, or let me just run with it? Or uh, well, you know, for the people who uh, really weren't here last week, maybe you could just briefly, um, you know, briefly talk about what happened. Okay. You know, to your family, to you and your family. Okay. Well, um, there were there were uh, again there were three different. Uh, actually, there were. I don't talk about. Uh, 2009 very often, but that was my brother's um, sighting or incident, it was, mm. which is part of the Kokomo boom in Indianapolis. But when we were kids, we had three three incidences. Um, we had 80 acres of property. We were we uh, raised horses, and we had the restaurant in town. And in '66 and '67, uh, our family and my mother and and we, uh, myself. Um, we had an uh, encounter on our property, which was quite different than 69. In 66, um, we uh, remember seeing a, a craft that looked like a turtle shell. Um, we remember seeing imagery, um, uh, hallways that 
that turned like a question mark that were very uh, white. We uh, remember being like almost uh, it, it going from sitting down while we were awake to <clears throat> feeling like we were wrapped in something like a bubble wrap and inverted and and like being hit with an ocean wave. I mean, it was then this calm and this serene feeling, and then knowing and seeing very, very vividly, but having other people around that saw it feel that you were very placid and, mm-hmm. and, and unresponsive. So what happens, what happened to my brother and I and how we felt when this, whatever it is that we got caught up in, we were very, we thought we were alert and we, we felt like we were alert, but we weren't responding. It was almost surreal. Mm-hmm. You know, and and to me, I I wonder how and what what really happened at that moment because I I, I was actually laying in bed talking to my brother, my younger brother, on the top bunk. And this was in '67. My mother came in to shut the window, and she thought it was going to rain. And we had it open a lot because they had a brook and wind, and we didn't have air conditioning back in 19 you know '67. So it was right. a way to stay cool. And it was and it was September, and everything that took place up in Sheffield and Great Barrington always happened in September. Anyone you talk to, it's always September. The two crop circles that showed up in 2012 and 2013, also September. Huh. But anyway, yeah, and always between these two roads, between Boardman and Route 7, everything on that stretch of land between Boardman Street and Route 7, they run parallel with each other. You must have way. you must have ley lines that run. Something like that, and there's a river. The, the Housatonic River runs between them, and that's where they're all seen. And a lot of the times that w- when they're reported, they, they're they not going down. They're rising up, mm-hmm. uh, up from the waterway, which is not far from the um, – the uh, what is it? The uh, Hudson River Valley either. So so in 67 when I'm sitting here, this is the most vivid moment, the very first vivid moment I had. I'm, I'm laying in bed. Talking to my brother, he's having animal crackers. He's sitting like Indian style on the top bunk. He always liked the top bunk. So we see this light outside a window. It looked like a ring, almost like a, a hula hoop, white and blue light. I'm staring at the thing through the bottom of my, my bed where the ladder comes down, and all of a sudden it just fired in the room. It was just like I, I, like I boom, like a, a ocean wave just hit me in the chest. And I went from laying down to like – I felt like I was standing up almost, and it all happened with like a four-second period, like boom, boom, boom. I'm standing up, and then all of a sudden I felt like I was encased in something, like someone in like super fast motion just wrapped saran wrap all around me, you know, like bubble wrap or something. I couldn't move my arms. I was like almost frozen, mm. but, I was, but I was alert. See, that's the thing. I My mind was alert, and all of a sudden I felt like I was inverted, like I had flipped upside down. Hmm. And and then boom, I wasn't in the room anymore. And 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 my brother, um, he, you know, ran down the, the the bunk beds to get my mother, and and they wouldn't respond. And he was trying to wake them up. You know, Tom's gone, Tom's gone. And he got between the wall and was like kicking my mother to wake her. She wouldn't respond. And my wow. grand yeah. my grandmother who worked at who was the governess for FDR's grandchildren. She was in the room with my mother because we had someone staying there from New York City in Hollis, Queens. We're from New York City anyway, but staying in the in the room uh, next to us, so there were two people in my mother's room. Neither one would respond, my grandmother or my mother. And then they finally came out of it and woke up, and we're going across the the, the banister, the the uh, you know, to go into the room where Matthew and I were had been sleeping, and. Uh, all the it sounded like all these doors slammed simultaneously, like ba ba boom. Wow. And and that's the last thing my mother really remembers. And then she next thing she knows, you know, Matthew's no longer with her. And and so I was on this in this hallway, this wrapped around little question mark white hallway, um, not really knowing I guess why, you know, what what I was supposed to be doing. But I know that I, I remember being scared at this point. And I wasn't cooperating. I was like, there were, there was something going on. I was like handed off. I was like escorted down this one hallway and then let go, I guess, or released and to, in, in, to someone else is custody or however you want to word it. And I was standing there facing this individual and just in awe, I guess, and and not. I don't feel I wasn't understanding him, or maybe I was supposed to be understanding. Maybe something wasn't working, something wasn't clicking. But I just remember looking around me all the time. You know, where's my brother? Where's my brother? I, I guess because I just at the time I, I just didn't know if he was with me, not with me. Was he okay? Was he? Was I scared? I mean, I just remember calling out for my brother, 
And uh, the next thing I know, he was there. So it seems like what happened with my mother and my brother and those doors slamming and all of a sudden my brother not being there anymore and then suddenly with me, it's almost like he was brought to me. It's mm. as crazy yeah. as it sounds. And and um, and he had a club foot. He had a club – he had a brace on his leg and he remembers a lot of attention being given to his, his brace. And he had a little tugboat that he used to carry with him all the time. It was a blue and yellow tugboat toy and he had it with him. And and so he just kind of came with the brace and the tugboat and everything. And and the other thing too that's uh, interesting is that when we used to sleep in these like all in ones with the little foot things, you slide your foot in them. Oh you know? right, yeah, yeah. And that's what we were in. You know, we were we were wearing those. And then and so there's no shoes or sneakers on our feet. Right. And so my mother and grandmother they were in a panic. Uh, as far as you know, obviously we're you know. So my grandmother went out on the screen porch, and we had floodlights all along the property because we had horses, and she put on the floodlights. And my mother ran up to the stable, and and she couldn't find us, so she saddled up her horse and she went looking all over the property. She, you know, what is she supposed to do? We're not in the house, right? And there were markers on the property. We weren't supposed to go further than the the hay baler, and and where there were certain property lines, and and she exceeded them looking for us just. Not knowing, you know, what, what else was she to do, and sure enough, about um, I don't know, half hour later, whatever, all of a sudden, bang, there we are in front of the floodlights. No one saw us get to the floodlights. All of a sudden, we were almost in a driveway. I was on a bit of a hill. My brother was below me, and we're staring at each other. And I remember it like it was yesterday. I remember staring at his face. I remember him staring at me. We were not, in my eyes, we were not placid or out of it or anything. And, and yet here we are in these little, you know, you know, uh, all-in-one jumpsuit things that we saw. Yeah, slept. jumpsuit, right? That's, and, that's... and and my mother was looking at our feet. They weren't marked up or anything. So if we had walked, if we had ever, if we walked even 15 feet, we would have cut our feet open because it was right, there were right. it was a rocky dirt driveway, and and so that's weird too. But um, you know, there we are, maybe uh, 15 feet away from each other, just staring at each other. And my mother jumps off her horse, and she ran out. And in, in, in Discovery uh, uh, Alien uh, Mysteries, they show her like in a nightgown and stuff. Now she was dressed. She comes up, scoops um, scoops my brother up, scoops me up, brings us into the uh, kitchen, and we're sitting at the kitchen table. And I remember where I was sitting. I remember looking at the sink and seeing the refrigerator, and her giving me baby aspirin and wiping us down with towels and giving us orange juice and. And you know where were you? What happened? And and they were frantic. I mean, they really were. And and my grandmother was just, you know, she was kind of catering to me. My mother was more catering to Matthew. And and then um, they brought us into the living room. And we used to have this big roaring fireplace. And we used to have this powder would throw in the fire, and it would change colors. And she was trying to get us to to do something to to get active again. And we wouldn't. We weren't. You were kind of a little stunned, uh, you know, or or withdrawn because of everything that happened, probably. Yeah, but in my eyes and my brother's eyes, we thought we were fine. You know, that's the weird thing about it. Our minds were moving like a hundred miles an hour, but our bodies weren't. Mm. So we were like, yeah, I don't, I, I still to this day don't really understand how that happened, but we were just like energized, but not responding. Yeah, maybe it was uh, maybe it was something that stimulated uh, your your telepathic abilities, and you know it was it was still spinning when you were brought back, and uh, I think that's probably one half decent explanation anyway. Yeah, <clears throat> something was going on. So uh, in sixty in sixty nine now, um, or six, I'm going to say sixty eight, my mother. Um, you know, and again, this is back when my mother was like 27 years old. My mother was young. Um, I was born when she was 20. So um, anyway, so she would go back to the restaurant, the only eatery in town, and she was talk to people about it. how could you not, right? Did anyone see this? You know, are we the only ones that encountered something like this? And so a lot of, you know, maybe 5% of the people that came in there were actually, you know, had seen something or knew of something or someone had seen something. But most of it – the talk or, or the conversations were kind of one that, uh, you know, hey, you know, no, you know, the, the new people, the new because we were new in town, actually, you know, uh, it didn't go in our favor. And, and so it, it started to turn sour. There started to be uh, a little bit of a, a, 
arguments, uh, push and shove situations. Mm. Uh, my mother used to refer to that table of four who would come in with the suspenders and the smelling like horse manure and w- cleaning out the place, you know, be, you know, just to be a jerk. And those standing in front of the front door that wouldn't let people in. So it became kind of a, a tough place for her to work. And, and so that's kind of how the paperwork, that's where a lot of the paperwork came from, the, those who gave statements and testimony because they remember all that negativity and hard time that the restaurant had to serve. Yeah. But it was the only place to eat, so people actually went there, but there was such a mixed uh, mixed feelings. And and in 69, when we were leaving the, the restaurant and taking that shortcut home, uh, again, between 7 and Boardman Street, the same area that everyone keeps seeing it, uh, we went down that dirt road and over this old clanky bridge, and as soon as we got out the other side of it, uh, sure enough, it looked just like an upside-down Hershey's Kiss, and, and it was rising up with almost like a pointed lights coming down below it, with it whether it was a reflection of the water or whatever, but it looked like an upside-down Hershey's Kiss, like a white Hershey's Kiss. And mm-hmm. and it moved up, and it went behind the line of trees, and my mother uh, slowed down, obviously, and you know, my grandmother saw it first. She was looking at us in the back seat of the station wagon and happened to see the light. And what is that? And and then um, as we moved down the road a little bit, it, it it was moving faster than our car was. That's for sure because it was way behind us. And my, I'm I'm going to guess my mother was maybe doing 20, you know, 15 or 20 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. And so this thing went and kind of almost got up in front of it behind the trees. And then, then there was a break in, in this line of trees, which was really kind of hard to see through. And then all of a sudden, no trees at all. It was like this big break, probably, uh, I, I'm going to guess, like 20 yards, okay, where it was not, nothing but the open field. And that's where we stopped. And sure enough, we're just staring at this 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 thing. I mean, it was it was hard to kind of make out because it did kind of illuminate in a, in a, like a light, like a two-watt light bulb. And you know, I'm going to guess it was the top of it. Well, it's kind of hard to say, but we were we had to look up out the windows at this thing. So it was higher, as high as the trees anyway, and it was probably as long as to give people an idea, maybe two and a half to three. Like if you were to look at like a like a mobile home, mm-hmm. you know, you know that long. So it was very long. It was not a small uh, craft, but it wasn't um, it wasn't huge, but it it was it was impressive. And I can and, imagine. <laughs> and so. I look back at my brother. Now we're kids, so maybe it didn't affect us quite as my mother was just blown away by it. My grandmother was in awe, but my brother and I were just we were younger, so I think we were a little more, uh, you know, we're looking back and forth at each other, and he was looking out the window to the right of the car, which was the opposite side. This was on the driver's side of the car. He was looking out the passenger window because it was something glowing like whether it was a reflection of water or something, but it looked goldish or yellow. It was enough that it caught your attention, and it was pretty good size. It was probably you know the size of maybe a uh, – I don't know, maybe um, you know uh, a big – you know like a pickup truck or something. I mean it was right. a big, big, big glowing area, and so we're looking back and forth to see if this – is this reflecting from it? Where is it coming from? And and so at one point, I was looking out the window at this thing, starting to scan back, and all of a sudden I could see inside the car. So the the light from this vessel or, or what have you, either the thing lowered or it just – it was brighter, but I could see inside the car. Now, before it was higher than the car, and the car was still dark, and we the thing itself, this craft itself was illuminated – but the car itself was dark, uh-huh. and all of a sudden you could see because we had like that cheap blue plastic leather, whatever it was back in the day. You could see the dashboard. I could see my mother. I could see the knobs on the radio, you know, the steering wheel. I mean, the whole car was lit up inside. And then all of a sudden, this eruption of cadians and crickets and what sounded like frogs, and it just kind of exploded. And it's like really loud, and it gave me chills for the longest time like this mm. running down my arms and back every time i heard that and you know those crickets and things and and then bang i mean we weren't in the car anymore and no. <laughs> and i remember being in this vessel this big open area or like look a like an airplane hangar and i've mentioned that millions of times it was like lights along the corner of the ceiling where the wall met and, and like single light tubes and uh i was on some type of a, a, a 
a metal tray or, or gurney or something, and I just stepped off of it and started to walk slowly towards more like the middle and then stopped, and then this door opened up, and uh, this person, I guess, you know, who knows what it was, came in. Um, it was kind of dark, but he was standing in a lit area and came up, and I was grabbed by my left arm and was short, like right around where the muscle is in your left muscle, and walked, walked out, like escorted out this door and, and into a hallway, went to the right, took a left. So I went, I, when I went out, I was taken to the right. So I went down maybe, I mean, it's like 20, 20, 30 feet. It was a, mm-hmm. just a quick, quick left and then a right into a room. So where they took me was not far from where I was. Um, and this room that I was brought into had a wall that bowed inward like a, like a can, a big, and it was glassed in. And um, that's where I saw what looked, you know, very much like like an ant on two legs. Wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I saw two of them, and and they were as soon as I came in, I, I passed them when I came in, so I didn't actually see them when I came in. And I sat, and then I saw them off to the left, where this Bowden wall kind of went inward to to uh, where it met the actual wall, you know, because it like it was like a half circle, you know. And that's where they were on the left-hand side, and they were facing the left. They were facing the wall. So I was looking at them from almost the back side. Well, and- listen, Tom, uh, we have to go to a commercial break. Um, what I would like you to do is take maybe five or ten minutes on the other side and finish what you were talking about, because I think it's important that people hear other people's experiences, because I'm sure there's a handful of people out there that are wondering what the heck happened to them, and, and hearing you talk about it. Uh, really does help. So we will be right back. You're listening to the Starborn Connection on KGRA Alternative Talk Radio, your connection to the multiverse. We'll see you in just a few. Hi, it's AJ with Vibes Mind, Body, Spirit. The Vibes Tribe seeks to assist you in creating and maintaining an uplifting and balanced state of being in your personal space. Palo Santo is a mystical tree that grows on the coast of South America. Palo is loved by many for its energetic cleansing and healing properties and is also popularized for its heavenly presence in keeping your energy grounded and clear. Burning Palo provides an uplifting scent to raise your vibration and is also beneficial for relieving stress, anxiety, depression, and emotional pain. Palo Santo is also known for relieving symptoms of the common cold, headaches, and asthma. We offer Palo Santo in resin, powder, or by the stick. Go to OnlineVibes.com for all of your vibration elevation needs and receive a free stick of Palo Santo with any online purchase over $25. Shop OnlineVibes.com, that's OnlineVibes.com, and get your vibes on today. Hi folks, let's wind the clocks back 60 years. Food was different. Food provided health and nutrition, and using supplements was minimal. Unfortunately, now we have chemicals, GMOs, herbicides, and pesticides that can be quite lethal in the name of our food supply and, of course, the ever-loving dollar. Supplementing our diets can be very important to stay healthy. Cleansing from daily intruders to the body might be critical. Live strong and take charge. Log on to GetTheTea.com. Our herbal tea is a great way to cleanse from intruders. Our supplements is a great way to maintain and improve your health. When your health is not up to par, go to GetTheTea.com. No GMOs, no fillers, and organic. And very helpful in keeping you at the top of your game. Life is too short to feel, uh, you know what I mean. Stay in the game, at the top of your game, with GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Again, GetTheTea.com. There are many sounds in your day-to-day life. There are sounds that wake you up. Sounds that make you smile. (laughs) Sounds that energize you. (laughs) And sounds that help you relax. But there are some sounds that can alert you to danger and can help save lives. 
Wireless emergency alerts, now on many mobile devices. Use a unique sound and vibration to bring you information about severe weather events, amber alerts, or other emergencies in your area. With critical information from local sources you know and trust, you can be in the know, wherever you are. For more information, visit ready.gov slash alerts. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. <laughs> KGRARadio.com Hey, welcome back to the show. Uh, this is the uh, second hour, and Tom is going to be with us for about another uh, 10 minutes or so to finish up the story. I think it's important um, that people hear what different people go through because it helps them to kind of put that puzzle back together again and fit that piece, which represents you know the encounters with aliens, into the puzzle, integrated into their lives, in other words, and try to make something out of it. Um, Tom, go ahead and finish that up. Yeah, uh, yeah. So this is '69, and this is this is uh, probably the one, probably the the, the moment. If, if there was ever a moment that bothered me, it was this one. And and uh, and again, I just to, uh, to to comment on on how I felt. Um, there there was a, a a big swing in my emotions. I there were times where I was. Uh, you know, affected emotionally and, and physically. Um, I became very disconnected. There were other mm-hmm. times I, I was very uh, calming and, and cooperative, and other times that I would almost like come out of it and, and be frightened. And so, however, whatever this was that was taking over me, and I always thought it was this electromagnetic field that because our neurons are stimulated by electro uh, ELF or what have you, and there was electromagnetic fields in, uh, on our car that was that spun a compass. So there was an ELF field associated, so maybe that, you know, did play a part, you know, because I know that certain frequencies, 10 hertz, I think it was comatose, and you you can make people laugh with a a 6.6 hertz. So there are, maybe that played a part in it. I just want to throw that out because we were not the same. We were not, over over an hour's time, we we were never really – I shouldn't say I don't really know, but I mean from I remember at least the parts that I remember, we there was a swing in how we felt like you'd almost come out of it. So um, when I was in this area where I were these what and I still to this day say they look like ants on back on the standing on two feet, um, I saw them from the from the, like the back side on an angle, and. I was just, I remember just looking at them because they had legs and st- they stick like legs that looked like reminded like ba- I've seen bamboo shoots and it reminded me of bamboo because I had rings on it and almost like a teardrop type of body and this head of looked like a football basically I'm trying to paint a picture here and and it moved and, it, and the head swung and looked at me and almost like a security camera would you know just kind of moved like I wasn't even uh, I was irrelevant you know yeah and. and and I just freaked, and I, I, and again, this is when I was, you know, I was coming out of whatever it was, and I, and I bolted, and I went to the right of this room, and I went out into this big hallway that was a huge open area, and uh, and I was brought back in, and uh, I didn't know where, you know, when I went out there, there were three intersecting hallways to it. I remember that it was like a big Y that came into the circle. I was brought back in and to the room, and again, um, it was not a. A gentle thing. It was a little uh, militant and rough, and I was put on a table. And whatever this was that came out of the ceiling lowered, and the table rose, and it kind of sandwiched me between the two things. Uh, there were holes in the side of it. There are things that were put on my body that looked like large raisins, black raisins, and like packs. Um, I remember that they were put on my leg and my my side, and I felt a hit, a hit uh, not a hit maybe, but like a, a a couple of bumps to my head, and um, and I remember. If, feeling it hurt and I went out. It didn't knock me out. I think it was just something that hit me and then all of a sudden I went out. Maybe it was from the packs that were put on my body. I don't know. And then I remember being back in that open area again and there were trays there that reminded me of trays you might find in school that you'd put like projectors on, you know, those little uh-huh. parts that they were there. Um, and then again, I was out and I, I, I was in the car and when we, or when I, um, 
or we were all back in the vehicle because we we did hear voices too. We heard our mother and stuff. I mean, I'm just talking about my my part of it right now. But we were all there, not next to each other, but we could hear each other. Mm-hmm. When I was in the back of the car, um, you know, and and finally came to is when my grandmother had been in the was driving now, and she wasn't. She was in the passenger seat. So before this happened. My mother was in the driver's seat. My grandmother was in the passenger seat. My brother was to my right, and I was on the side of where the craft was on behind my mother. It was the craft that we had seen earlier was on the left side of the, of the car, on the over the behind the trees. So when we when we all got back in the vehicle, my mother and grandmother were reversed. Everybody was mixed up. <laughs> <laughs> they well, no, do just, that sometimes. They just, really do. <laughs> just my no, my brother and I were the same. It was just my mother and grandmother that were. <laughs> But anyway, so my grandmother took the car down the road a little ways, turned it around, and went shooting back to town. Uh, Silks, which is a, a, a like a, a convenience type of store mm-hmm. in town, it's still there today. Again, it's still there today. And she went back in, you know, because at the time no one else was responding. We were all out again. We didn't even wake up until we got into that part of town. So when we pulled up. My grandmother actually went flying by it, turned around and came back because she was going too fast. She missed the entrance, um, opened up her door and got out. I think the slam of the door is what startled me and woke me up or what got me at least somewhat conscious. Yeah. And I remember seeing her outside and I got out of the car and started to follow her into silks. And, um, and again, these people at that, at that store remember this. And so she went in and she – Went right by him. She went there for help apparently, but then walked right by him and got tangled up in these bikes and strollers, and, and uh, they sold baby carriages and stuff. And she started to um, push one back and forth, and and um, almost like there was something like a baby in it or something. She was very attached to this stroller, and and so I kept trying to grab her arm to leave, and and finally, uh, you know, we, we did. She went by the. Um, it's a lot of noise, by the way. Went by the um, the uh, the clerk on the way out, and uh, and got to go back into the car. But at this point, my mother was awake, my my brother was semi awake, and we got in the car and we left. But now we didn't realize that night that there was a broadcast on WSBS radio that's that a lot of people were calling because they saw this thing. And at that night, it was also given a, a high net classification, uh, a C a CE one at the time, and. Uh, and so from there on out, um, the rest, the mood in the restaurant changed. You know, a lot of people had witnessed this, and that's kind of what, you know, were all this years of of uh, conversation and uh, uh, you know, arguing and you know, different opinions. Those three or four years at the restaurant is is what became historically significant to the community. And that's kind of, if you want to put a bow around it, that's how the whole thing happened. Wow, that's amazing. But there were a lot of other things that were seen around there. If, if, if you want to know, there was a ball. I don't talk about this much. There was a ball about the size of a Volkswagen bug, and it was orange. And a lot of people saw it. I was with a bunch of kids after school near a park. This is like 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and we were up. There used to be a motorcycle gang in Great Barrington called the Warlocks, and they took over a, uh, a milk exchange. And they had all these bikes out there, but it was right next to my, my buddy's house. So we – there was a park right across the street where people sled. You know, it was like a almost like a Times Square where you had the park that came down in the middle. Right. And we were standing there, and all of a sudden, all we were all walking home from school, and we saw this big orangey ball. It looked like it was almost on fire, but it was like self-contained. It was like a big orange globe with movement, and it was shooting right at us. And it went to the top of the park. It took a ninety degree. It went down the park. It went up over homes and then dove like into the woods. We were all running after it. Everyone there was running after it. I mean, I'm talking forty to sixty kids. Wow! It was all the all the kids walking home from school, and we couldn't find it. Um, there was that other time where we, you know, I, I mentioned to you earlier, um, where it looked like a moon or or like the moon, and all of a sudden it just sh- it was like a like a crescent moon, and all of a sudden it shot to the ground. So. There was a lot of activity over there, and there was a lot of um, meters on homes that started working uh, oddly, or you know they had uh, not sure why their electric bill was so high, why these meters uh-huh. were going down. So there was a lot of uh, uh, electrical issues in the area too. So anyway, that's basically Sheffield. There was mining for magnesium. I mean the, the magnesium for the atom bomb. Uh, oh, well, yeah, yeah, that's right. You told me this. Yeah, it was mined about three three miles from the monument in our restaurant. So. 
it's a, it's a it's a weird little town that has a lot of anomalies and a lot of weird history. Um, the the Peter Riley case, the death in Canaan. Remember that Barbara Gibbons murder? They oh yeah, yeah. Her. That was our house. That, wow, wow. That, that we bought the house afterwards. That property, that house was on it. So there was just a lot of weird, uh, just strange. It, it's there's something to that area. And sound sounds like a movie. Yeah. <laughs> it really does. I mean, it's like a, just. It's odd there. You should go there sometime. I mean, it, it, I'd love to see on the 22nd if you could make it. Oh, I wish I could, man. Ooh. Yeah. Times have been tough, let me t- <laughs> tell you. Yeah, I know. I know. They have been. Yeah. But anyway, so that's that's uh, that's basically it. I, uh, you know, WSBS um, broadcast it. Um, their letter has been in the Roswell Museum for a long time. Um, Kevin Titus. Uh, who's a historian there actually remembers seeing a mutilated, uh, you know, I, I've never seen a mutilated animal, but apparently there, there were some, um, and this was not, this is in Connecticut, but it was only about five or seven miles from the monument over the Connecticut line where they found, um, you know, some calves that were mutilated over there. And, um, along with some sightings around the same time. So that, that was taking place in a town called falls village. Um, and then there were sightings in Stockbridge and uh, Jug End. I mean, it was a very active area back then, and, and s- apparently it still is. I mean, people still see things today. So, anyway, well, that's that's Sheffield. That, that is a pretty cool story, um, and I still think it would make a really cool movie because because of all the strange stuff. Tom, thanks for coming with uh, coming on with us for uh, you know two weeks in a row. Um, why don't you tell people one more time uh, when Paraween is and uh, tell them how they can get to the park if they want to visit that. Okay. Well, if, if actually, if you just type in now, it's uh, UFO Monument Park is actually on uh, MapQuest. It's it's uh, uh, it's it's on Google or you know Google Maps. So, uh, but it is in Sheffield, Massachusetts. It's it's near the old Sheffield Bridge, which has a Wikipedia also. So uh, UFO Monument Park, Sheffield, Massachusetts, Sheffield Bridge, and Paraween is in Salem. It's the last time we're going to be in Massachusetts, at least for some quite some time. It's at the uh, Waterfront Hotel and Suites, and there's going to be an awful lot of people there uh, from uh, and along with uh, Lionsgate Films and Paramount Pictures and and uh, you know Mike Barr, Travis Walton, I'll be there. We're going to be having a huge party and get together at Flying Saucer Pizza, which is actually our sponsor. So um, anyone who uh, listens to the show tonight and wants to uh, save a uh, you know, ten ten dollars or twenty percent. Um, there's a coupon, digital coupon code, which is uh, Paraween Rocks. Just type it in when you get your ticket. It'll uh, it'll save you uh, you know quite a bit actually. And um, also, we're showing uh, Blair Witch again, the Blair Witch Legacy. So uh, at, at nine o'clock, and that's that's free too. And, and the vendor area is also free to public for the entire day. So fantastic. Hope to see you. I would love to be there. Oh, would I ever? Well, Tom, yeah. thanks a lot. And um, we'll have you on again later in the year, uh, you know, talk about, let us know about Paraween and how it went and what happened. Okay, that would be good. pretty cool. All right. Well, listen, take care, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll be in touch. Thanks, man. Take care, okay, guys. Okay, you got it. Bye. Bye. Well, I'll tell you now, uh, what I wanted to do um, briefly, because uh, I let Tom go over an extra 15 minutes, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, Tom DeLong. I don't know. Have you heard? Uh, oh, the, uh, yeah. The, yeah. The disclosure that didn't happen. Well, <laughs> you know, something did happen. Uh, you know, uh, you know, Tom has had a longstanding belief in, in the existence of aliens. And according to him, he has been at it for a very long time. And he claims to have had his phone tapped. He's on email uh, chain of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He's in contact with hundreds of professors and scientists across the country, and he claims to have outed senior scientists at Lockheed Martin, as well as scientists that work underground at Area 51. Um, you know, this is his description of the phone tapping. He says, you know, uh, yeah, it was for quite some time, years ago. There was somebody who was gathering 150 hours of top-secret testimony specifically for congressional hearings on government projects in the U.S. secret space program. 
people from NASA, Rome, the Vatican, uh, you name it, they're all on there. The top 36 hours that summarize the best parts of all that footage. I had it hidden in my house for a period of time, and during that time, I was flying this person um, out along with somebody that was Werner von Braun's right-hand assistant. Um, Werner von Braun, of course, as we know, this is Tom speaking, uh, was a a Nazi scientist that we brought over uh, when the war ended to build our Apollo rockets. Um, And on his deathbed, he told this person a bunch of stuff, and I was flying them out to Los Angeles, and we were taking... uh, certain meetings at the time a lot of weird stuff started happening um yeah pretty wild descriptions uh you know I, i'm gonna cut this down just a little bit because um i thought i would have more time um but uh now he also at times felt he knew too much and and that he was being watched he he said in, in an interview to give you an example one time i remember bringing up a very specific craft that i believe we're building Um, in secret to emulate the phenomenon that our government has been observing for decades. So I started talking about the craft, its magnetic slide system, and how it displaces over 89% of the mass of the ship, how it ionizes the engine, how it glows. I went through the whole thing. This engineer looks at me. This guy is about 70 years old, and he goes, you better be real blanky-blank careful about what you're talking about. And I go, okay, so I'm close. And he goes, I'm not blankety-blank kidding with you. You better really be uh, careful. And he calls me up the next day, and he goes, I've had calls about you. If someone comes and asks you to get in their car, don't blankety-blank get in the car. And he laughed and and, uh, hung up. So uh, I'm just going to skip over a couple of more things that he said. Um, you know, I, I read through the article, I've read about five or six different articles and I'm going to give Tom the benefit of the doubt. You know, he talks about an abduction experience he has, um, he has had in the past. So now Tom DeLong's big UFO announcement has come and gone. What was, what was really good, what I think, I think is a big announcement is that he announced the creation of the, to the stars Academy of arts and science. He's created this company dedicated to the research of UFO phenomena from A to Z and without being, uh, as he says, suffocated by mainstream ideology and bureaucratic restraints. Now, that that's kind of true. You know, that prevents a lot of research from happening. Um, so can he do it? Well, he has partially shown us that he can by bringing together a large, diverse group of interesting and interested people, scientists, researchers, and it seems he has made serious contacts with government and military officials in the pursuit of information. I wonder yeah. how he could have done that. Well, I, mean, I don't know. Money money can do a lot of things. And, and you know, his time with Blink-182... I mean, is he an engineer besides being a singer? Like, how how did he? I'm just really curious. How? Well, I mean, he was with the CIA. He knew people in the CIA. Yeah, he, yeah. He, like, I don't know. You know, it's why? very interesting. Yeah. But you know, a lot of people were upset because there was no big reveal, no aliens, no. No, craft. it was just about yeah. you know going just to the stars, but it wasn't like yeah, there there was an alien contact, and we have proof. I thought that, you know, that's what everybody thought. Well, you know okay. something. Now he's asking for money to support his thing. So, I, you know, I don't know. I'm gonna yeah. take. I'm gonna take a different approach to this. I, I think that it, we have to be cautious when we have all these. I'm gonna just use this loosely this time. These spooks from the government, and yeah, he absolutely. and he's um, the outlet. And we have to be concerned about disinformation and what kind of information they're going to be dangling out there for him to uh, put out there for the public. Yeah. You're talking about a guy from Lockheed uh, Martin Skunk Works for 39 years, project director, and some of these other individuals. And I'm, I'm a little bit cautious and concerned about what exactly they're going to be coming out with. Then you had uh, Luis Elizondo who supposedly worked within the agency that was detecting unidentified aerial threats. Now, he did say, we have clear, because I watched it, I actually streamed it, 
Um, we have clear evidence, uh, photographic, and I, I don't know if he said video, but I think he said photographic evidence, not this blurry stuff that you see. And I was waiting. I was waiting for something to yeah. be shown. And, yeah. and then I was looking on his list. There's no astronomer. You've, mm. you've got an individual like Mark D'Antonio, yeah. and we've had him on in the past, and he mentions, you know, he's got this project with uh, detecting aerial uh, phenomenon that's in the skies, this array that he's going to set up with Douglas Trumbull. To me, it makes sense if they're really serious about this. Yeah. Bring a person like Mark D'Antonio on board who's doing the on-the-field work if you really want to make this global in nature and you want to incorporate all the possible avenues for research and development and just bring everybody in on this, I think it would be great to um, have someone like Mark involved because one thing we know about Mark D'Antonio, this, he is one of the most grounded, factual, logical. Oh God. Yeah. You, no, I agree. Who better to analyze and at least put this out and in the public and say, well, you know what? Yes, this could be such and such because that's what Mark does. And you know what? Sometimes they're afraid of getting the real answer. Well, that's true. Yeah. So maybe they don't want people to do real uh, credible expert opinion on these so-called photos. So I'm a little apprehensive, but I think Tom DeLonge is really doing this genuine. He he says he's been interested in this uh, since he was a child in u- u- ufology. I think he's really doing this in earnest, and he really is being a person that is doing this for the right reasons. But yeah. I'm a little concerned about if they're taking him for But didn't ride. he say that all aliens are bad? Like, didn't No, he I don't think he said he that. Didn't, he didn't say no, that. No, and no. actually, I don't okay. know if you guys want to bring Mark in for five minutes, but he's willing to come on for five minutes. If you yes. guys... Hey, let's bring him in. <laughs> yes. man. Yeah, Mark Mark is listening. Don't, and don't I think... let him wait outside. Yeah, no, let's let's bring him <laughs> in. in Mark. Yeah, he's coming in right now. I just, I'm adding uh, him to the call. And this is, good, this is what good. live radio is all about. <laughs> <laughs> So Mark will be joining us in a second. I'm trying to connect with him now. But yeah, awesome. I'm interested to see what Mark has to say as far yes. as. So Mark, you're on with Julia and Michael. Hey, hey Mark. Julia and Mike, how you guys hey, doing? Oh, we're doing good. We're doing good now that you're here, right? Oh, you're so nice. I enjoyed my time with you last time when I was on your show. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. Thank I enjoyed you. having you. Yeah, we had a fun time. So what do you think of Tom DeLong? Um, I have a, a couple of, of feelings about Tom. Um, I mean, uh, I actually wrote him the other day because I, I, I wanted to uh, find out if he would be interested in, in uh, backing our UFOTOG2 project, which we've mm-hmm. renamed to the Aerial Anomaly Detection System, AADS or ADS. Um, and we renamed it because when people hear the word UFO, uh, they, they run the other way. So uh, I talked to Doug about this actually uh, the other day, and I mentioned, hey, if if we're going to look for funding for this, I think it's best if we rename it, rebrand it, and widen the scope of the project. In other words, make it something that can look for asteroids, make it, you know, the killer asteroid, make it uh, something that can look for meteors, and put these tracking platters all over the world. So it'll be the aerial anomaly detection system. Uh, if you take UFO out of it, then science can embrace it. Mm, um, right, and, right. And, and I think that's a better uh, approach. And uh, and I got him to agree with me very quickly on that. He saw it and says, "Oh, okay." I mean, that's that's the extent of the argument. It was, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, okay." So wow. it was good. Yeah, that's really something else. I, I think I think it's a good thing. I really do. Yeah, no, I do want to. You asked me a question which I actually didn't answer. Kind of, I didn't mean to, but I, I kind of skirted around the question. <laughs> I actually uh, wrote the long that to let him know that. And we're doing this aerial anomaly detection system. And if it's something that, uh, you know, he's interested in in adding to his agenda, uh, you know, Doug and I would consider uh, doing that, you know, because, you know, it's not like we're we're not elitists in any way. We think that if this is a, a group project, everyone should be involved if they could be. Uh, the data belongs to everyone, not just us. It's not right. how it works. So I think it's important to... You know, widen the scope a bit and to include everybody that wants to be part of it. And I suggested that if he wants to, you know, we would we would certainly entertain that mm-hmm. uh, because it's truly a scientific endeavor to determine whether they're here. And it's something that is small and can be deployed worldwide. 
uh, you know, given the funding to create these new platters. And, right, right. Right, right. And we might be able to get funding from multiple sources, not like Kickstarters, perhaps, but maybe from, you know, in Canada, maybe we can get a Canadian uh, uh, firm to put up the money in, in Africa. Maybe we can get, you know, a uh, national, uh, you know, an international uh, relief effort to fund it because it can look for things that are pertinent to, uh -huh. you know, to that. It doesn't have to look just for uh, unidentified flying objects. You can also look for uh, other things you know, going in the atmosphere. It could track contrails, for instance, to, to, to get a good idea beyond satellites about yeah. the global spread of contrails on the planet and then see them over time. I mean, there's so much that this can do. In other words, it's a listening post. It's a, a viewing right, post. It's right. something that can view the world, right? Am I wrong? Tell me about that. I mean, if oh, wrong, no, 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 no. I think that would be a great idea. Yeah, absolutely. To combine. Yeah. Another thing, sure. too, is they were, they were describing these conceptual designs and models of a proposed propulsion, a futuristic propulsion type of craft. I noticed. Who yeah. better than FX Models? Mark, who's done extensive work with so many different organizations, military personnel, etc., and of course, in, in, you know, in in, in uh, media itself, entertainment, and that's that's part of their wing. That's they have yeah, their entertainment it, wing. It's true, and of course, you know, with Doug, he's the legend of special effects for crying out loud. Exactly. So, uh, you know, he's the legendary guy, Academy Award winning guy. So. I think that, you know, uh, it would be a good fit. But you know what? No matter what we see, they have to see it. Yeah. And if they and if they don't, they don't. You know, and that's okay. Uh, there's no no harm, no foul. It's just like I, I want to see all these efforts out there. I want to see them succeed. I want to see CubeSat succeed. I want to see you know Dave Shock and that team. I want them to succeed. Mm -hmm. I'm not competing mm -hmm. with them. I, I'm you know I'm I'm working with them. You know, I want them to succeed. I want other people doing kind of what we're doing to succeed. Because the the thing is, we want the answer. Yeah. We don't. Yeah. We don't. We don't want to be the ones who own the answer. We want to get the answer for all of us. Right. And right. and that's a very different approach. Some some of these groups like they circle their wagons and they they try to become you know the owners. They want to be the instigators. Okay, it's going to belong to us. We're going to have all the UFOs in the world. Right. Yeah. Right. You know? Well, you know what I what. What I say is, is that, you know, uh, they have – in order to find the answers, in order to be able to share the answers, you got to let your ego go. You, you, you can't right. be doing it because, hey, I want to be the one to discover it. Uh, you know, I is the wrong operative word. You want we want to discover that's, it and work together. Right. Yeah, That's right. I, I totally agree with that. And, you know, I think in the beginning – I was guilty of thinking, you know, and, and I didn't really say this publicly, and it lasted about 14 seconds. I thought, <laughs> wow, if we could find UFOs and we could own this data, boy, that would be something. Then I thought <laughs> about what I was saying. Okay. I'm human. I, had, I, went, I went down of that course. path and thought, and I said, wait a minute. You know what? This is the wrong approach. Mm -hmm. You know, if I try to limit, to limit it to just what I know and just what I can do with my little team, my, my, my. I said, I'm saying the wrong word here. And just like <laughs> right. you said, it's it's got to be we. Yeah, you absolutely. And, and you drop all the pretenses. You drop all the titles. You just say, look, we're going to make this all happen. We are going to do this. And we are all on the same team. And uh, since doing that, I, I've actually uh, – a lot of st stressors, a lot of potential stressors have just sort of melted away because now it's a matter of trying to just get it done for humanity. And, exactly. and just let it go at that, right? That's what it has to be. It has to be. And, so. and I'm talking about we on a worldwide scale. We can't yeah. be uh, you know, fighting against Russia to get it first or China. It has to be something that we do together. That's exactly right. And I, I agree with that 100%, Michael. Absolutely 100%. And the you thing know? is, uh, with Mark, they get an astronomer. Um, yeah. They get this aspect as far as um, the special effects, the entertainment, and they get everything else. They get the on field investigative research. They. I mean, you're yeah. getting so yeah, many different components. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, well, I, I think it, it's a no-brainer. Well, actually, it, it's you know, I I appreciate that, Bill. I mean, and I'm I'm humbled by your your confidence, and and I would certainly strive not to disappoint. But I can tell you this: you may see it that way, and and Michael and Julia may see it that way, and I might see it that way, and Doug might see it that way. But DeLong and his team have to see it that way, and they have True. to say. To them, they have to say this is a no-brainer right. in order to start that process to include us or 
you know, some of us. Look, if, if Doug gets on the team and I don't, I will be just as happy, mm-hmm. okay? Because, mm-hmm. you know, Doug's a big name, and, you know, Doug would draw. Uh, but honestly, what would end up happening is Doug would then come to me and say, okay, let's do this, <laughs> you know, and I'll be part of it. So either way, I'll be part of it. I don't care. It's just that we got to get it done because all of us want the answer. Yeah. And I think that's very important, too, you know, we <clears> – <throat> And Michael, you said it before, which is very important. You got to drop the egos. You got to just put me, 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 my, my, my. You got to put that away. Yes. You know, I mean, at least for this thing, put it away. If you want to look in the mirror and say, look at me, you know, down the line, well, fine. You could do that. But for now, drop the pretenses. You're right. And and, and become uh, part of humanity. You know, be willing and accept the part uh, the, the fact that you are one of the many. Not yes. the only one, right. not, the, not the elite of the few, you know, elite of the few. It's like you're one of the many. Uh, and, you know, as we've heard before, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. right. And, and yes, I borrow Star Trek, but hey, you know what? Uh, but you know, book- it was it's true. It really is. Yes. I agree with you guys. And you it's need a diverse true. team. You need a diverse team of people with different skills. Oh, you yeah. Know. Oh yeah, I don't. I don't have all the answers, you know. Doug doesn't have all the answers. Together, we have some good answers, but our science team has more answers that are wonderful. Uh, and couple all that with the Long's team, and maybe that's a, I don't know, maybe that's a super team. I don't know. Um, uh, maybe it's a, a a recipe for disaster. We don't know. Mm-hmm. We have to work it all out and see if it'll work. And I, I, I'd love to know and love to see if. If he would like to open that dialogue, I would love it. You know, because then we could actually sit down. We're all motivated to do this. You know, oh, we're not, yeah. Yeah. You know, we're not so wrapped up with everything else that we're not going to devote tons of time to this because, well, frankly, we already have. You know, so yeah. uh, and it's not going to stop anytime soon. No, yeah, you're right. Well, that yeah, would we'll be really cool to out. have that. I, I think, Julie, I think it would be really great to have a, a uh, I don't know, a, a Skype. Um, I don't know, round table. That would be really cool. With Tom along? Well, if he wants to come. He, you think uh, he'd I've, come on the show with us? I don't know. I've got open, uh, I've got open spots. We'd like to hear what he has to say. I, um, actually, yeah. I actually contacted them on behalf of KGRA. Oh, yeah. And I'm yes, waiting did, yeah. for a response. Good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How long ago? Today. Oh, today. Yes. Okay. And that's pretty yeah, I, cool. I, I contacted him yesterday and, and wrote a mail, an email to him using their contact form on their website because that's all I had for an email address. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, they wrote me back saying, uh, we're not accepting proposals at this time, you know, uh, but you can you can like us on Facebook. I mean, that kind of thing is like, oh, lovely. No. <laughs> well, you know what it is? They got someone, maybe an intern who's just reading it and not paying any attention to what it is. Yeah. And And so they're not really – they're not passing it along, perhaps, or maybe they are. Uh, but you know, I think that somebody could get in a lot of trouble for passing something by that might actually be good for the project, and right, right, and, and not uh, not doing it. You know, not not looking at it at least. So, well, so Tom DeLong, he did say publicly at some point that he was an abductee or he had contact. He had a, he had an abduction experience where he had missing time. I, I okay. would tell you about it, but it you know it's too long. It's it's, not, it's a whole show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> All well, right. I don't that's know. Fair enough. Story. Yeah. Story. I just know. You know. Well, Tom, if you're that's listening. Little... Yeah, come on. Well, we're, we're here and uh, be happy to have you. We'll have Mark come on, um, and Bill, of course, will be sitting at the table, and we can talk about it. We can uh, we can just, you know. Shoot the bull and see what's happening, and uh, if you'd be interested in, uh, you know, joining the whole community. And speaking of a roundtable, since we've got Mark on for a couple more minutes, Mark, we still are planning to have um, a gathering oh, here. To, you want to fill them in, Mike? Uh, yeah, uh, Julia and I want to do a a live on the spot show at one of the Sky Watches. And, oh, not uh, location. Yeah, on location. Oh, cool. And uh, we're, we're looking at, uh, you know, either the last weekend in... Well, you know uh, what? I got a date. I was looking at the calendar. Oh, good. I don't want to do it Thanksgiving weekend because I'll be drunk. No. Okay. <laughs> That's no, well, so, it might be more fun that way. I have know. family coming like Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So December 2nd, that weekend, the following weekend. That might weekend, be good. Works yeah. great. 
So maybe Mark, wow. if you're if you're free that weekend on a Saturday, you you know you're welcome to stay here. So and... you're gonna do it at your place, Bill? Yes. That'd be cool. And then you, of course, you you could stay over. That we're there, they'll stay over, and uh, we'll make a nice dinner, and we'll have a nice fun night doing a sky watch. Sounds and then... like a plan. Oh I'll yeah, a, and I'm going to do a massive. Med- I'm going to do a meditation to bring them on because they come when we do meditation every Fantastic. time. It works I'd... for me, so I'm crossing my fingers. <laughs> I'd love to see it. Yeah, and then we'll, love to see it. during I'm, the sky watch, Julie is my secret weapon. You guys <laughs> will actually sit down with my uh, with Mark. I mean, and maybe we'll I'll get extensions and put the microphones outside, and put a secondary <laughs> camera, and I'll be inside making sure everything's working on this end. Oh, and... sure, you're gonna be in inside the warm, and we're gonna be out in the cold. I get it. <laughs> I oh, we'll all sit around weather. here inside and let the camera you do its gotta thing. You got to give me hot chocolate. Oh yes, with the whipped cream yeah. and 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 some and, and some vodka. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have fun, but remember, wow. we're going to be. I, that, that's the oddest combination I've ever heard. No, the vodka will have tonic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, but I we'll... was wondering what was going on there. Maybe I'm thinking, what was that for? Like to rub, da- like a rub down or something. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So yes, Mark, and we hopefully you'll be able to attend. It'll be. What was the date? December 2nd, Julia? Yeah, I think December 2nd works. That's Saturday. Yes. December 2nd, the week I, after. Well, yeah. Works for me. Works for me. Okay. Right, well, I'll, I'll check. I think that I, I, I actually, December 2nd sounds like something I, I should know about uh, from, some, from something else. So I'll have to make sure that it's not like a Navy deadline or something else. So I'll have to. Uh-huh. Okay. I, I, don't, I don't think it is. But, but you'll let me know anyway. And by the way, yeah, I know. for the listeners... You really need to go to Sky Tour live stream. That's Mark D'Antonio's yeah. YouTube channel. He has the observatory in front of his home. He's got just he takes just amazing uh, photos and video of the sky. Tell us a little bit, uh, Mark, about what you do with Sky Sky oh, Tour. Oh yeah, Live-Stream. yeah, please. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. The uh, Sky Tour live stream was something I started. On, uh, uh, on the behest of Bill and and, and uh, Paul and Keith from PK Space Imaging, and uh, basically, uh, as an astronomer, I've always been in tune with the sky. So I've always wanted to bring astronomy to the masses. And what I'm doing is I have a nice, very sensitive camera that I've modified to uh, show the night sky and show very faint objects in the night sky. Uh, almost instantaneously. So we steer to it, bam, we can see it, you know. Um, I can record the sky that we see, which is streamed out as well in full 4K video at various sensitivities up to over 400,000, you know, sensitivity, 400,000 ISO, basically ASA for the old timers like me. And uh, yeah. we, uh, we actually show these objects in the sky and we discuss them. The other day, for instance, we looked at planetary nebula, which were dying stars. And I talked about the little tiny white dwarf that's in the center of these planetary nebula. And I talked about what makes a white dwarf a white dwarf and why it doesn't become something even more compact called a neutron star Mm -hmm. and something even more compact called a black hole. And I talked about why that all happens. So it's like I take people on a tour of the night sky, show them the different objects, and then we discuss what we're looking at. And we discuss why it looks the way it does, why the colors are what they are. And uh, I do it in a way I think that that people understand. I hear that people actually understand what I'm talking about because I try to put it in terms that you know, everybody can understand because yeah. everybody wants to know and they feel it's out of their reach. And I just don't believe that's true. I think that once people understand, then they can take it further on their own. So Sky to a live stream is, a, is a, a, an outlet, a place for people to go to watch the night sky unfold live. Uh, the chat room, the people can join the chat room and they can talk back and forth. My, my moderator my primary moderator in Sky Through Livestream is Amanda Curran. She does a wonderful job, uh, you know, fielding all the people from the chat and running the questions through me because I'm doing five things at once in the observatory. So I can't look in the chat at the same time because the chat is actually a bright white screen and I'm in red light in that mm, observatory. Right. So I can't look at these bright screens because <clears throat> that ruins my night vision. So uh, Amanda fields those uh, chat questions, gives them to me. And then people also have requests. Can we see this right now? Oh, sure. I'll steer that right now. We go to it. Bam. They see it. Huh. You know, 
So it's really cool. It's like a astronomy on demand sort of a thing. Love it. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and, um, yeah and, and people love it. You know, they, they really like it. And Amanda also um, helps Mark. She's the one that pretty much came up with the idea for the Facebook page, Sky Tool Livestream with Mark D'Antonio. And, and she did it on her own without yes, even she asking did. me. And it was the, one, the best thing she did. It was like a cool. wonderful birthday present kind of a thing, wow. even though it wasn't my birthday. Oh, <laughs> wait a minute. Wait oh, a minute. Well, it is Speaking. Tuesday. It is Tuesday. Happy birthday. Yeah. That's happy right. Birthday. Happy, happy birthday. birthday. Oh, oh yeah, you're right. Though. It's the 14th. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot well, you, my own you. birthday. And I, I wasn't baiting you. I swear to God. I didn't know. I forgot. Does anybody want to try to sing? I'm not. No. But oh boy! <laughs> For the listeners, if you ask me, I'll, I'll have Clem sing, and you won't like that. <laughs> I could, I could give you guitar accompaniment, but uh, you know. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> oh, uh, I, 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 we could I jam here. My, I have a music studio and oh. a broadcast desk you here, know, so yeah. Mike, you know oh, I got fantastic. the drums here. I've got the guitars and everything. Oh, I'll bring mine. Uh, but but just before Mark gets to go, uh, because we we got about twenty minutes left of the show, you can see some incredible photos that he takes. He, oh yeah, it's posted yeah. on the Facebook page. So if you go to uh, Sky Tool live stream with Mark Antonio on Facebook, uh, Amanda or Mark or some of us uh, that are administrators will post. There's a lot of people that contribute to the site, uh, to the Facebook site. So definitely go check that out. You'll see. I mean, right. stunning. Stunning photos. Well, wow. yeah, I, I use uh, I use some special techniques to actually do image processing on them after the fact. Um, and uh, I use a technique called stacking, which is as common in the astro world, where you you take say two dozen of the same thing, so the same exposure, the same length of time, same sensitivity, and then you stack them digitally so that all that data gets added together, yeah. and then you take these what are called dark frames. And so where the background is getting brighter and brighter and brighter as you add all these together, the dark frames allow you to get rid of all that new, you know, that background that doesn't belong. And all you have is the, what we call the quote unquote signal and the noise goes away and it really increases signal to noise in a picture and signals what you want. Signal is the data that you can see and make sense of with your eye. Noise is just, you know, static and that's not helpful. So uh, you know, stacking helps that. So I, I show I show people how to do that. And on, on a on a cloudy night, sometimes I'll actually stream. And I did a cloudy night stream uh, a couple of weeks ago, Bill. That, I don't know if you were there for this one. Uh, and I and I, I took people through the lunar reconnaissance orbiter quick map feature. Now I don't know if you're familiar with the quick map, but the quick map is a uh, a site that's run by the Arizona State University. Right, ASU, and what they did is they have all of the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera, LROC, uh, data up there, and it's the entire moon, wow. front and back, okay? And you can zoom in to a level where it's only, uh, where, where it's as tight as 0.5, half a meter per pixel on the camera. So you can see rocks that are about a meter across, mm, man. okay, on the moon, Yeah. So that's really small, and you can see that for every nook and cranny on the entire moon. Now, wow. that uh, is really important for the people that want to look for these lunar anomalies. If they think there's anomalies, well, then go to the LRO quick map. You know, you yeah. look it up like that, and you, and you can just go there. It comes up in your browser. Bam, you can go down, and you can look at this particular area, and you can see that, no, Pythagoras Crater doesn't have a giant gun in the center of it. <laughs> right, Pythagoras Crater has right. a strange mountainous region, but you can zoom into it and zoom into it so much far that you can see uh, gullies and slopes and material that slid down the slope and rocks actually that have left rolling paths, you know, down the central peaks of some of these craters. So, uh, you know, so that's, uh, I, that's I guess cool it, I guess it wouldn't be hard to see the other uh, Apollo landing sites either. I was just going to say, if you click um, on the left side, there's a whole list of all the additional features you can select from. One of those features is LROC featured images. Cool. And you click on those, bam, there's the Apollo landing site. You can zoom in, you can see the landers, you can see all the tracks from the rovers. You can see the American flag in some cases. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's cool. yeah. And and people say, all right, can you see the American flag with the Hubble telescope? Well no, the Hubble's in Earth orbit. Okay. <laughs> and the American flag on the moon would correspond to a fraction of one pixel on the Hubble sensor. Yeah. So we know that 
you know, pictures are made up of many thousands of pixels, right? An image that makes any sense has to be made of at least 320 by 240 or 300 by 200 pixels. Uh -huh. And, you know, we can't have a picture that's in a fraction of a, a pixel because a pixel is just one color. Okay. So, you know, the Hubble can't see that with that kind of resolution. Uh, yet, you know, people think, well, it looks at all these very faint objects so far away. And they're confusing distance uh, to very far objects as being uh, a requirement to see, you know, very, very tight detail on the moon. And they're two totally different concepts, two totally different capabilities. Wow. And the Hubble doesn't have it. You know, the James Webb telescope goes up next year, and that, that has a mirror that's uh, uh, 21 feet in diameter to the Hubble's <laughs> eight. And we're going to be able to see planetary atmospheres around exo you know, oh, around that's, stars, around exoplanets. And I'm so excited so about cool. that. Yeah. 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 See, it's all coming. It's all coming, guys. Well, see, all you crazy. moon landing doubters, all you moon landing doubters out there, check it's the, there. <laughs> the quick map. Yeah. yeah it is. Yeah. And you, oh. know, you know what? If you start looking at that, you know, Michael and Julia, you guys, you'll get, you'll get totally lost. You'll end up spending like, hours you go wow i had missing time that yeah no, that's what i yeah, that's not really true. the yellow hey, browser did it hey mark did you hear about the new announcement is it a, i don't know if it's real or not but i saw it a few times on facebook that nasa discovered something it's like the first time they ever saw it there's like a new announcement and it it's you know it's i, not I saw the, the press i did see the uh, press uh brief on it and i didn't uh I didn't actually get to see what the actual announcement was because yeah. they said they're going to make the announcement like a couple days ago. I think um, it's Tuesday, then, Mark. I think it's going to be it Tuesday. Monday? Yeah, it's one of these upcoming days. Yes. Oh, Something so that's unprecedented, but it wasn't the – they already know about the sphere, the the, the uh, mega structure around that one star. Uh, the Dyson yeah. sphere? Yeah. Um, yeah, Tabby but... star – they think that it was a. Uh, it's actually. They, they they're saying that they think it might be an actual cloud of dust. Yeah. Uh, that is passing between us and the star. But the fact is, there's no overage of infrared radiation that you'd expect to see. Uh, so uh, maybe they're looking at it in a different way, um, or maybe they're looking closer to. Maybe it's closer to the Earth than they actually uh, expect it to be. I don't know. Well, they uh, make that. it so exciting, and then it's like. You know, the mega structure was exciting when they mm -hmm. first talked about it, but you know, <clears throat> yeah, I, I'm no. expecting some. You know, they make it so exciting, then it's like, oh, okay, well, well it's actually, <laughs> it isn't, it isn't actually NASA that ever said it was a mega structure. It was actually people that were speculating about the NASA announcement. Uh, yeah, it was actually. See, Tabitha Boyajian is the one. She's, you know, she's the one who, you know, was doing the research on Tabby Star. And Tabby Star was just a star that was part of the, the Kepler uh, retinue of uh, stars, you know, program stars they were looking at. Uh, and, and Tabby Star, as such, was you know one of the many, you know, one of the hundred thousand. However, when when Tabitha was looking at this star, uh, she noticed that there were some strange dimming events that couldn't be explained, and that was in the Kepler data. But then they discovered that. The star has been doing this behavior for almost well, just over a hundred years. Well, couldn't they wow. be? If it was like an energy structure, couldn't it be pulling the energy? Like maybe an alien race is using that star for its energy. Yeah, it has yeah, unlimited that's, energy, so it's pulling that's, it. That's why. It's that's coming. right. Yeah, Freeman Dyson, you know, had postulated about the Dyson sphere years ago. Yeah, yeah. And and of course, we know the Dyson sphere. Uh, we've seen it actually in a Star Trek episode, for instance. Yeah. And but the Dyson sphere was, you know, it's it basically is a structure that surrounds the star entirely, so that the starlight and all the energy from the star hits some element of the sphere, which that population can then use and capture. Now, the problem with that is, of course, that a star is a massive thing, and to build a structure around the star My God. would require more materials than any solar system ever has. It would right. have to be a monumental structure. So, in other words, they would need the kind of energy uh, that they that a population, you know, or, or a type five population on the Kardashev advanced scale uh, would have to do type two kind of work with a Dyson sphere. And oh, yeah. 
I can so imagine would, it would take several lifetimes to do it, a couple of hundred well, years. Well, well, if you have a race that's a thousands. billion years ahead yeah. of us, and they well, can yeah, create but, metal, they can actually create what they need. Well, sure. You know, and, and I, I actually postulated, and I think it'll come to pass. You know, when you think about the, the concept, and I, I, I know I keep going back to Star Trek, but the bottom line is uh, Star Trek has been replicated throughout science. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, in, in some ways, obviously the cell phones, okay. However, the warp drive as well. Uh, now, not the same way as in Star Trek and Roddenberry's mind, but uh, you know the Alcubierre drive was was something was postulated in '94 to get us from here to there in a very fast way, and, and that is to say, by basically warping space, folding mm-hmm. space. Okay. Now uh, that process, okay. That was called a warp drive because that was actually something El Cubieri did in de- deference to like Roddenberry in part, uh, but also because it really is uh, a warpage of the space time uh, fabric. Uh, space time fabric is a mathematical construct, but uh, you know if you think about it as um, a a uh, way to get from here to there without actually moving. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you actually it would it, when you have that warp bubble around your ship, you can actually. Basically, you're you're pulling the universe past you as fast as you can, right? And you're not limited to light speed at that point. You can go ten to a hundred to a thousand times as fast as light, um, because you're not really in this in you know in the constraints of our our, our four dimensional universe x y and z all moving through, you know, a time period. So, if you could do that, then you could actually make your way, <clears throat> you know, through the galaxy, uh, you know, fairly quickly or through to the nearest stars. Anyway, um, we could get to Alpha Centauri and uh, technically, we could get there in five days with this drive. Wow! Not nineteen thousand wow. years. Yeah, Ooh. not nineteen thousand years like it would normally take. But <laughs> <clears throat> when you travel down a highway, uh, you know, you see that over time you get bugs on your windshield. Well, <laughs> space has bugs on your windshield too that you get on the front of your warp bubble, and oh. those bugs are in the form of charged particles and other yeah, uh, yeah. detritus that builds up. You know, mostly energy type, uh, uh, you know, events. And so when that happens, when you stop your warp drive, all that stuff sloughs off in a very energetic, explosive way, according wow. to the way the Alcubierre uh, you know, tensor describes. And if that's the case, it could potentially destroy any solar system you're entering into. Oh, uh, so oh. the realistic time frame to get to a star like this using that, that kind of a drive is like two to three weeks. Because you start slowing down and bleeding this stuff off the war, the, this right, warp right. bubble little by little. It's a very, very complicated process. And it requires, uh, you know, uh, something akin to negative mass, which doesn't make any sense, you know, to most folks. So it's like, um, it's a, we're probably about, I, I've been saying like 100 years away from a Coke bottle probe using hmm. the Alcubierre principles. Um, that would be but, so cool. <clears throat> yeah, but because NASA is... is <clears throat> reworked, you know, through White, uh, that, that, that scientist White down there, they reworked the uh, the warp drive generating system on the ship to the point where it doesn't need this obscene amount of energy, which is the equivalent of converting Jupiter to energy. <laughs> um, right. But they only needs the equivalent of the Voyager spacecraft converted to energy. Now that's like a 10 to the 26th power yeah, drop yeah, yeah. in the energy requirement, and that's what made it attractive to NASA. Now they said, oh, this might be something we could do. And so they've actually funded a lab, you know, to look at it. So you see, the, the future's coming at us. It's being hurled at us by the universe. And little by little, we're going we're gonna to start to be able to, you know, interpret it, understand its rules and its regulations. We've already know how to, we already know how to go faster than the speed limit in the universe. We just have to be able to actually do it. Uh, and, and the technology is, is coming. You know, we're going to reach that point, And that's, that's going to be a wonderful day. Oh, yeah. Yes, it Absolutely. will. Tom DeLong, I yeah. hope you heard every word Mark just said. Okay, Tom. Nice. It's yes, in your, Tom. Yeah, the, ball's in your, the ball's in your court, Tom. For real. Yep. Ball's in your court. So, well, anyway, it's getting close to that time, isn't it? Mark, thanks for stopping by. Really. Yeah, sure. Great. Yeah. Thanks Hi. for having me. It's That's always, total, always good to have you. Total surprise, but I was, I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that uh, you, you you were willing to have me come out for a little while. Very cool, yeah. And, of course, thank you, Tom uh, Reed, for spending two weeks with us and sharing all of that information about your experience at Paroween, which ought to be unbelievable. 
That's uh, Salem, right? Yeah, Salem, Salem this yeah. year, right, right. Mm -hmm. So next week, next week, we're going to have a gentleman by the name of William Lawrence who has developed a way to communicate with aliens using visible light. So Ooh, that, that, that would awesome. be a very interesting program. Um, and on the 28th, we're going to see Grant Cameron again uh, talk about his new book. And uh, on November 4th, uh, an old alumni of the show, Susie Byler, is going to be coming. And that ought to be a, a fun show, too. She's, she's awesome. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. She said she, she felt led. She's, there was more things that she wanted to, you know, that came to light. She well, that's good. To talk about. Yeah. That's good. Okay. Guys, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, audience out there, we'll see you next week again. Uh, and once again, Mark, thank you so much. Yeah, thank it's you for having me. And I'm always learning new things when you come on the show. It's so exciting. Hey, you, you guys are great. Thank you so much. Ah, no problem. Bill, see you next week. Julia, see, see you, next you next week. See you next week, everybody. Love Joe, you. God bless everybody. All right. Good night. <laughs>